the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. As you all know, we're on a little earlier today than usual, but I have a very special guest today, and I am so thrilled that we have Karen Morrow waiting in the wings. Now, today, as you all know, I celebrate so many things, but today is also National Radio Day. And I was thinking about radio and how we all used to listen to music. And if you want to listen to a lyric, Karen Morrow is the one you want to listen to. And I was going through my collection today, and I pulled out something. I actually have a 45 of Karen Morrow, and I was listening to this. But I thought that before I bring Karen on, uh, I'm going to remove myself from the screen in just a moment, and we'll start with a clip. And I want to thank Alan Eichler for this clip. So here we go, and then you'll see Karen Morrow on the other side. She's always worth celebrating. Here she is. Here's a girl that's done very well on Broadway and in summer stock, and she's got a marvelous set of pipes and sings up a storm. And she had something later in the show that was a real kooky thing. She still got that. But listen to this gal sing. Karen Morrow. Here she is. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you. <sighs> Three years ago, you were a school teacher. That's right. <laughs> and that's something, and just things up the storm. And it's good to have you here. I figured that, uh, you know, that uh, since we got a little gap of time here, that if you'd be kind enough, I'd kind of holler one with you. Okay. And I know we haven't had the chance to run it, but <laughs> one time. But if you're willing... I'm game, and if Peter's got a little intro over there, let's give it a go. You got the first one, right? That's right. Whoa, 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 you play a simple melody like my mother sang to me. One with a good old-fashioned harmony. Play a simple melody. 
And here she is, Karen Morrow. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, okay, I'm gonna take my glasses off and I hope that I can see you. Ah, no, I can't see you and it looks better that way. But hey, listen. Uh, well, I do look better. I look better without the glasses. So no, honey, the glasses you, off. you always look wonderful. I watch your show and you just look spectacular and you look into the light and I go, my God, <laughs> the face. I mean, that skin and the hair and everything. I have taken at least an hour this morning to, to get so that I look okay. And and folks, I apologize for being on the phone, but I can't seem to get on StreamYard. So, okay, taking off my glasses, let me tell you about that song. Uh, the the next time I sang that song with somebody was with Garrison Keeler. What is it about these guys that want to do that song with me? I mean, that was years later because Jimmy Dean was the, he wasn't my first he wasn't my first uh, television show. I think my first one was Red Skelton. Ah! <laughs> and, uh, I know, I know, <laughs> terrifying. Uh, and this was my second one. Well, actually, I was I was signed on as a as a regular on his show, and um, uh, there, that's a long story. You know, I'm one of those people. They used to call me Richard. They called me a self starter. So all you have to do is say hello to me, and you never have to say another thing for the rest of the afternoon. Because I'll just keep talking. I'll, I'll let that works for me. I, I'm a good listener. Okay, good. I have to put my glasses back on again because I can't stand not not seeing you full face. So, okay, <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, first of all, uh, the, as I said in my introduction, today is National Radio Day, and I uh, I, I grew up uh, listening to the radio. I still listen to the radio. I want to. I'll do a shout out to Sirius XM Radio. Uh, they, I listen to the Broadway channel, Christine Petty, Seth Rudetsky, they play your music all the time. So you pop up two or three times a day, uh, whether you know it or not, you do. Uh, I'm sure you know that. Do you know that? Yeah, but not two or three times a day. I thought about once every two months or something. Well, no, I hear you more often than you may. Uh, oh, I listen, I oh, listen to it a lot. So I know it's there because it's always in the background. But did you grow up listening to the radio? And if so, who were the people that you gravitated towards? And when did you first notice that you had this gift, this voice? You are so smart. Are you telepathic or something? Because my parents were both singers and uh, opera singers. At least my dad wanted to be an opera singer and my mom too. And my mom was actually better. Uh, she had a, the beginning of a wonderful career when she was a teenager and doing concerts in Chicago. When she met my dad, he was, then they got married and he then went to radio on WGN in Chicago. So I'm talking the forties. Uh, I'm talking like, like, um, 41, 42. He was there until, um, until the war, the second world war was over. And then we moved to Des Moines and he was on radio in Des Moines. And so the whole, our whole background is radio. And sure, as a kid, are you kidding? Saturday morning, uh, it was my chore was to dust around the house, to dust the apartment. And I listened to Let's Pretend. And, and I, but I was sponsored by Cream. My weight is so good to eat as we have it every day. We're good for growing babies. But I, mean, I knew all that stuff. Then I listened to the Buster Brown show. And, uh, and at night, uh, my parents didn't know it, but I would listen to the um, 
the shadow knows wow. was the whistler and then oh oh my god and we listened to jack benny we listened to fred allen i mean that was our life and we listened to lux radio theater uh on monday night and my dad had like one line on one of those big shows coming out of Chicago. And my God, the whole family was sitting around the box in the living room, you know, the, the, the big box that was the radio with the speaker this big. And we heard my dad's voice. Oh my God, it was so exciting. And it was live and then he came home afterwards and we celebrated and stuff. So my whole beginning was was radio. Uh, and my, my, on my dad's side, he had a couple of cousins who then <clears throat> audition for the Ted Mack Amateur Hour uh, in Chicago. If it, yeah, radio, 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 radio. How did you know that? <laughs> well, it, it just fell into place that you're on the show today on National Radio Day. So it just I, happened that, that way. That is so fortuitous. That's wonderful. And I listen to the radio now all the time. I don't listen to Sirius XM because I don't get it, but I listen to. Uh, I listen to the news stations and I listen to, listen to classical music, K, uh, KUSC. I listen to that when I'm driving because it's, I just love classical music when I'm doing my exercises. And uh, and the news, of course, I have to tune in <clears throat> every day and get the news. I'd rather hear it than see what terrible things are going on. Uh, you and me both. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. So with the fact that both of your parents were in the business, yeah. uh, did it make it easier when you made the decision that this was the path that you wanted to be on? I don't know if it was easier or harder. It was never hard. I was three years old when I sang in front of people for the first time. My parents put me up on a piano bench in the living room and I sang God Bless America with a great big voice. And uh, the people really liked it. And I thought, oh, oh that's, that's good. Oh, oh, that's really good. So from then on, I did nothing but sing. And then when I got into grade school, grade school, uh, the, I went to Catholic school and there would be a class meeting every Friday. <laughs> As if we <laughs> were all in the same room all week long anyway. And somebody would always go, sister, sister. And they'd go, yes. Can Karen Morrow sing a song? And she'd go, yes. So I would go up to the front of the room and I would sing. I remember singing Golden Earrings. Now, how old was I? There's a story the gypsies know is true. Because remember, Dietrich had it. Well, of course. Uh, the yes. gold wings. And I knew that. I knew that, she, that that's the way we were supposed to sing it. So I sang all the time, all the time through school, through high school. It's what, it was what kind of made me accepted. And it was funny. And uh, the other girls were pretty and uh, rich. And I wasn't. But I was part of the crowd anyway, because I could sing and be funny. And that's, and thank God, thank God, literally God, thank God for the, the gift of, of voice. And singing, I, obviously, was the entree. Uh, when did the acting come about? Did you have acting opportunities where you were growing up as well? <laughs> Are you considering me an actress? <laughs> of course I do. Of course. Oh, honey, what I don't know about acting would fill the ocean. Uh, <laughs> no, I... Well, in school, hello, my first acting was in third grade, and uh, I played the lead. It wasn't Sunny of Sunnybrook Farm, but it was something with Sunny in it. And I was thrilled <clears throat> because it was the lead, and uh, everybody thought it was wonderful, and I had all the attention put on me. So then, then in high school, we did some plays, and I was always in them. And then... In college, in college, I took drama, and uh, because that's what I wanted to do, drama and music, and got in plays, but always had a minor role because the nuns, the nuns were not crazy about my talent. My talent was just much too big and much too broad for them, so they kept trying to put me in little plays, that kind of serious plays. The um, uh, I'm trying to think what, but some of them were, and it was the boys' college. It was the boys' college because, as I said, I went to Catholic high school and college, and then across the city uh, on another hill was the boys' college, <laughs> and that's when that's when a priest over there, for some reason, I don't know where he heard me, 
or anything it asked me to do, the lead in their spring production of Brigadoon. And so I had to act and I had to sing and be funny and do all that stuff. And that was absolutely spectacular for me. So you were growing up in the Midwest, am I correct? Absolutely. So there comes a point in an actress's, and I am going to refer to you as an actress. Thank there you very much. Okay. There comes a point in an actress's life or an actor's life where they make the decision to either go east or west. You made the decision to go west. West. Oh, well, no. Right away, at first, I made the decision to go to New York because it was kind of handed to me. I was doing theater in Milwaukee and, and like a nightclub review with, with some, some people at, a, at a, an Italian restaurant. <laughs> and I learned about Broadway, doing these reviews. The choreographer would always have us learn the latest on Broadway. And, uh, uh, and I was always doing those parts. And so I thought, oh, Broadway? Wow, because I didn't know from Broadway, even when I was doing the shows, I go, oh, that's Broadway, okay. Uh, and so- now, so Did you do any work with Melody Top, Top while you were there? No, that was later. Okay. That was later. I hadn't even gotten to New York yet. So at one point, uh, I was bragging about, someday I'm gonna go to New York. I'm gonna go to New York, because I really, and there was a, a, a girl dancer who came out from New York to do, to be, do a show with us there in Milwaukee. And she said, oh, good. She says, I, I, I'm going to get an apartment and I need a roommate. And I went, oh, just fine, fine. Get it. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the, I didn't think that that was going to work. So, of course, about a month later, I get a letter. I got us an apartment and you owe me $40. I went, I got to go to New York. I got to go to New York. So I went to New York and that started the whole thing about probably. Did that answer your question? I even forgot the question. You asked. That answers my question. Yeah. So, so you get to New York and do you have any clue as to what you need to do to start finding work in the business? Uh, I knew I had to have the right audition dress and the right audition shoes. And I had that. I bought that in Milwaukee before I went. And... Uh, and I had, I had the right audition song. I had two songs. I had a, a belter and a ballad. And the day after I got there, I went to my first audition for Subways Are For Sleeping. Mm -hmm. And it was a chorus call. I what I know. I just saw in the paper. I saw in the paper in Milwaukee before I left. So I, I, I went there. I either took a subway or a bus or something. Went there. And I was typed out. I mean, I, I went, what? 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 What is typed out? You know, they went down the line, you know, 10 people. You stay, you stay, you go, you go, you go. And I went. I didn't even get to sing. So I kept going to those things. And somehow, somebody I knew, let's say David Hartman. Why would I know David Hartman before? I think I met him on the street or something. And he was going to his agent's office. And he took me in and... And the agent said, oh, honey, with a cigar. He said, uh, can you sing? And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, well, sing something for me. So I did my audition song, <laughs> which was, uh, what does he look like? I wish I knew. Uh, uh, and a six foot seven or three foot five bells are ringing. And uh, he just thought that was wonderful. So he called his wife. And he said, honey, listen to this. Sing it again, sweetheart. So I sang it again. And he represented me and he started submitting me for everything. And I mean, within four months, I had the lead in that off-Broadway show, Sing Muse. And that's what started everything. I mean, that that brought me, that brought notice to me and everything. But because of this little agent, of course, whom I left and went to with the Billy Morris office, <laughs> he wasn't too happy about that. But yeah. Yeah, I mean that. that now, did you have any survival jobs while you were working towards Broadway? Never, never. I, I don't know to be proud of that or not, but I kind of am, because there was always something. I was, I was one of those people who could fill the bill. I could go sing at somebody's apartment. I could go sing at a restaurant. I could go sing, but after after that show. After seeing Muse, uh, I was up for so many shows, and I immediately went on the road as Tammy Grimes' standby in the unsinkable Molly Brown. 
And then word got out that it was a good standby. I came back and everybody wanted me to stand by. Judy Holliday, uh, this one, that one. And then, and then I just kept going to audition. And then television. Then television came along, which was my dream. That's all I ever wanted to do was either be in the movies or be on television on the variety shows. That's all I ever wanted. And eventually that happened. And that's why I moved out here. Now, was that an easy transition for you to go into the television variety shows? Because you were making a lot of appearances doing that. You mentioned earlier Red Skelton, I think, was your first. Yeah, I got that job when I was on the road standing by Tammy because I, I didn't have a role. I mean, I was her standby. So, <clears throat> so the Morris office started sending me to all these places out here. And I got the Red Skelton show. I got Jimmy Dean. Yeah, I got Jimmy Dean then. Uh, Sid Caesar wanted me to do uh, Little Me, but they already cast it. It was just, I was the new hot little blonde that sang loud. I mean, I wasn't really hot looking, but I mean, I was, I was new. I was new. So, uh, so that was my dream to get to do all these, to do all the, the variety shows. Oh my God. To wear, to wear a beautiful gown and be and have lights and makeup and hair. Oh, oh, oh. And Jim Brochu was watching, and I haven't missed you, Jim. He wants to know, how did I Had a Ball come about? Who was watching? Did you say Jim Brochu? Jim Brochu, yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We've known each other forever. What a talented guy. Uh, oh. I, I want him on the show, but uh, he says he's in semi-retirement. So <laughs> I want you here, uh, Jim. Okay, so he wants to know how I got a I Had a Ball? Yes. Okay. I was somewhere, probably doing stock. Uh, and again, you know, the Morris office was calling me. And then on my day off, I was auditioning for things. I auditioned for I Had a Ball and Kelly. Now, <laughs> now Jim wrote you. Well, no, you know, you know Kelly? Okay. So one of the agents at the Morris office said, oh, you've, got, you've been offered this. And the other agent said, and you've been offered Kelly. Give it some thought. And I went, okay. So I had been seeing a lot of publicity about both of them. Uh, Kelly was so uh, touted. I mean, this was going to be, oh my God, this was going to be wonderful. And it just sounded great. But there was poor old Buddy Hackett, whom I thought was pretty funny, and these other people. And I thought, that show has nowhere to go but up. Kelly has nowhere to go but down. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> oh, I, exactly. Who knew? But I, I knew that, that when, you, when you're advertised that high, you can't live up to it. Whereas poor old Buddy Hackett, I thought, he has no limit at all. You know, all he has to do is take a step up. But because of Buddy, and he was very popular then, so I accepted that job. And thank God I did. I mean, we got seven terrible reviews. We should have closed that same night. But because of Buddy, God bless him, he did his act every night after the show. And he would bring in guys, his, his buddies who were in other Broadway shows like Sammy Davis and, and uh, Steve Lawrence and Joey Bishop and all that. He would bring those people in to do the show afterwards. So we were sold out for six months. And then he got very tired and uh, came in with, in a wheelchair with supposedly a broken leg. But I knew that he just he just needed to get out of there because he was he was carrying the brunt of the whole show on his shoulders. So, but, but Jimbo, that's how I got I auditioned and I chose that instead of Kelly. Something, you know, clack click. Well, for those of you who don't know, Kelly closed in one night. <clears throat> and about a and I made the joke about a man that jumps off the, you know, Brooklyn Bridge. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know what Buddy and I and Luba, Luba Lisa, God bless her. May she rest in peace. We were going to Coney Island because our show, uh, I Had a Ball, was about Coney Island. So we went there to do some publicity shots. Uh, and, I have one of those publicity shots. I'm going to bring it up here. Oh, my God. And as we're going across the Brooklyn Bridge, buddy, I wish I could remember the joke. Shame on me. But it was, why is this bridge famous? I went, oh, yeah, because it was built early. He said, no, because you know, Steve Brody took a, oh, my God, I haven't seen that one. Oh, look at how cute. I love that photo. <laughs> it, was, it was winter and of course nobody was there. And so it was just, you know, cold as could be. 
but it was Coney Island and Buddy was such a good sport. God bless him. And Luba too. I mean, she was adorable, adorable. Now you mentioned, you know, at the, it was a different Broadway at that time. The fact oh, that, my. I mean, Actors' Equity, there's no way that a star would come out and do an act. Uh, Pro Bailey used to do it at the end of uh, Dolly, uh, at much to the consternation of many of the other actors in the show. Uh, but did word start getting out that Buddy Hackett was doing this? So oh, that people yeah. coming to see the show? <clears throat> Pardon me. Oh, yeah, very definitely. And you know who else would do that? In stock, when I was doing Annie Get Your Gun with John Raitt, uh, he was not, it wasn't Frank Get Your Gun, it was Annie Get Your Gun. So, of course, I had the last bow and all of that. And he, uh, I mean, he wasn't mean or anything like that, but he decided to do his act or, or do at least three or four numbers after the show. And so by the time he finished, we were all dressed and ready to go out, you know, and then, then he, he wanted to go out with everybody afterwards. So we'd all go to, to the local, whatever it was in Ohio, and he would hold court. And uh, I mean, a real dear guy and a, and a consummate pro, but that's that he felt that that audience came to see him and they did. His name was above the title. Uh, I don't but you, know. But you did get this great song out of it, which I'm going to show later uh, in the in our interview. Um, I had a ball, oh. um, and I, I, I am sure you were asked to sing that song everywhere. No, you weren't. I, well, no, I. I mean, it. I. I think uh, the history of that number is shocking to me, and I. I say this with all honesty. If it were not for that number, if it were not for that song, no one would remember me, no one would care. I would not be on this show right now because there was a whole, including my manager uh, who came to my rescue uh, about you know shortly when I came out here. Anyway, there's a whole gay contingent, ma male gay contingent that somehow sparked to that song and the delivery of it and the the bombastic or whatever it is, the big voice and all the dancing behind and, and the moves. And, and I, Glenn Rosenblum keeps saying, I'm obsessed with that dress. I'm obsessed with the dress. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so I've never, I did it again. I did it at, um, Anna White's memorial service out here. And, uh, I told a story about Luba Lisa. Oh, and I, it was an Anna White story. But it was so funny. I mean, if you're interested, oh, oh, there she is. Yeah. Ann Roth did the costumes. Yeah. There's the dress she did for me with my big legs, my big Polish legs. Mm. Why didn't I get the Swedish legs from my dad's side? No. This picture. Mm. But, but anyway, that song has been so identifiable. It's, it, it's always popping up, Richard, always popping up. And I am so grateful to the point that a month ago, I was asked to do an evening, a speaking evening, entertainment evening, at the Coachella Valley Rep in Palm Springs, which had a very large population of, of gay men and friends of mine, the people that I'd worked with and all that stuff. And Glenn Rosenblum has his evening and he was having guests. And he had Terry Ralston as a guest in his program one night with doing Sondheim, talking about Sondheim. And, and then he had Eileen Graff. So wonderful, wonderful Eileen Graff. She and was she, on the show yesterday. Yes. Oh, she was? Yes. Oh, yes. Great. And uh, uh, she talked about the 70s. And then I was there to represent the 60s. And listen, I'm 85. So I'm not too happy oh, about, okay. about you know, getting on stage. I remember Barbara Cook having to come out and sit in a chair and everything. Well, guess who decided to do this and sit in a chair? But, uh, but anyway... And my, my wonderful next door neighbor, uh, friend, landlord, uh, music director of my workshop, Greg Schreiner, somehow worked me into doing I Had a Ball. And we got an arranger that John McDaniel had done for me years ago that was much lower. And uh, I sang that at the end of my, of my uh, talk. And instead of, <laughs> instead of standing up and swooshing the skirt, because I couldn't, I was sitting in the chair, so I kept kicking up my legs and swishing my pants and all that. Was just, but so that's, you know, I've, I've done that song and so I'll never do it again. But I am so grateful for that song. 
I wish that Jack and, and Stan were still alive. I could I could thank them. But word for that song, and only that song. Uh, Jim is asking once again if you could tell us when you first heard Stan play it for you. Oh God, Jim, well, good questions. Yeah, oh yes, I remember. Do you know, I don't remember the first time, but I remember maybe it was in the rehearsal hall and everybody was there and they played it because everybody had to hear it and because they all got to dance to it. And I, of course, listen, it was my first Broadway show. I knew nothing, nothing, except I had been on stage in Milwaukee, but here was Broadway. So... That was exciting to know that that song was going to be. And, and they said, and when the afternoon was over, they said, listen, you need an introduction to this song. It has to have a verse. You can't just start singing, love was hiding. And they said, what is your favorite? What is your favorite introduction? And I went, I had a dream, a wonderful dream, June, dear. And they went, got it. And so the next day they came in with, do you see that cloud up there with the number nine? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Love was hiding. I laughed. I mean, is that something? Isn't that wonderful? God bless them. God bless them. So I remember that. I don't remember the sits probe. I don't remember the first orchestra rehearsal. I must have been dumbfounded. So because I, I have no memory of any of that. It must have been absolutely. I remember opening night being absolutely terrified. Well, that you lead me to my, ne to my next question. I, if you were able to really enjoy that first night on Broadway, uh, or if the nerves take over and it's almost like an out-of-body experience, and also going with that, uh, the experience of wor working with someone like Buddy Hackett, and what you learned from him uh, that has stayed with you your entire career, both as an artist and beyond that. You're so smart. Uh, opening night was terrifying. I couldn't sleep the night before. My parents came out from Des Moines to be there. <clears throat> I don't like people visiting, but, but now I really don't like people visiting. Then it was, it was good that they were there. And I remember sending my mother off to Ernie can't think of Ernie's name, but he was doing the hair for the show. And I sent her off to his salon in the afternoon so he could do her hair. And it was thrilling for her. She had to take a taxi and take a taxi home. So I was kind of worried about them. My dad, of course, was just beaming with pride. But I couldn't sleep the night before, so I took a sleeping pill. Still couldn't sleep. I took another sleeping pill. So needless to say, and at that in those days, there was only like one kind of sleeping pill. It was a big honker. And uh, and, uh, and so I was, it was out of body. I, I don't know who I was, but I walked on stage and I just did what, I just did what I'd been rehearsing. Ah, uh, uh, and I sang with the loudest I could. And I was so, I, I, I said to, I said to my students there that I was comatose till I was 47. Now I was 25 when I did that show. Comatose, I had no idea what I was doing. I never really learned how to act. Uh, so, I mean, I was just boring as could be. Thank God I had this voice because it, you know, it got me into doing a lot of stuff. And I was blonde and I was, I guess, cute, which I never thought I would ever be in my life. We all, you know, I mean, I don't know about the other girls, but I was one of those people that's that, that was just really never got a boyfriend, never, you know, any of that stuff, I mean, the terrible skin, all that, everything. So this was, it was something that I felt was destiny. Yes, of course, I'm going to do a Broadway show. But it wasn't fun. It was fun later on once I got over the initial shock. But but then I got invited to do all sorts of other things. I mean, all sorts of other things, mostly television. Dun, da, 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 da. Well, I want to ask two questions about that. Number one, when did the fun begin to happen for you? <laughs> the only Broadway show I had fun in on Broadway was my last one, which was Drood. 
which I saw you in brilliantly, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yes, I did. Why? Because, because I could be nuts. Now, see, the, the most fun I ever had was in, in all those shows that I did in stock, because there was no. There were critics, but as Jim knows, they are they are too severe with one because they have to support the theater so that their theater will keep running. Those places in Ohio, and uh, I mean, they had to keep supporting. So, so I never read the reviews anyway. There, I let in Pittsburgh. One guy in the show came in to my dressing room and said, "I." I read the view. I don't think you're as bad as he says. I mean, he was one of those kind of actors. You know, I can't remember his name. Well, thank you, thank you. That's so nice of you to say that. Um, so I, I just flew fancy free through all of those shows. I forgot your question. <laughs> now, when, when did the fun begin? Oh, oh, fun, fun, fun. Uh, all stock, all stock was fun for one reason or another, because I was doing great shows. See, I had never done a hit. So I Had a Ball was not a hit. Joyful Noise was not a hit. Uh, 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 music music was not a hit. Uh, I forgot. Oh, well, now I take that back. Oh, oh, oh. In between those, I did stuff at City Center. Wonderful stuff at City Center. I did uh, Oklahoma. Richard Rogers was there all the time. He became a booster of mine. Uh, oh, and then I and we did uh, Brigadoon. Of course, I did Brigadoon. Karen, I have a question for you. When you're doing um, I Had a Ball, and you're all working on this show, was there any indication to anyone that there would it would not be anything other than a hit? Sure. The experienced people, of which there are not many, Richard Kiley, uh, whom I adored, was, um, he didn't say anything. I know, th I know that some of the people of color, because of course it's about Coney Island, so we had people of color in the show, because uh, Lloyd Richards was brought in. The award-winning Lloyd Richards, who had just directed, what was the big thing he had just directed and, and uh, got a, a Tony for? I want to say Fences, that's not it, it was way before that. Uh, which was a wonderful black show. And all of a sudden he's called to direct Coney Island musical. Da, 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 so the people of color complained about him. We, we were never in the same room at the same time with, with anybody. I mean, I remember it was, it was the chorus was there, the dancing chorus, the other chorus, the Compro Mario parts are over here and then the leads are over here. So one time, uh, Rosetta Lenoir, oh. Dear friend of mine. Oh, yeah. uh, yes. She oh, she was wonderful, but she really was very upset with Lloyd Richards. And I don't know why. Uh, I mean, she's, she was uh, black. And I so there, there was some, some sort of friction. And I said, well, you know, I said, he hasn't helped me at all. I, you know, I didn't know how to talk about any of this because it was my first show. And so I talked to my agents the next day about something else. And they said, how's it going? And I said, well, people are complaining about Lloyd Richards. <laughs> Guess who was fired the next day? Lloyd Richards. Uh, Raisin in the Sun. Oh, someone, was that? Uh, I think someone just pointed out it was Raisin in the Sun. Okay, okay. I thought it was something else. But but it, but, but here, here was a man, a wonderful director, in plays and plays about the, the Black experience and stuff. And uh, I guess maybe they thought he would be serious about this. and he'd be, uh, Who knows? Who knows? But it didn't work. And then we had a couple of directors after that. And finally, a man by the name of John Allen uh, kind of helped us to get to opening night. We limped to opening night. But Richard, then right after we opened, and we knew we had sold out houses, Richard then uh, started rehearsing for this dumb show out of town called Man of La Mancha. Hmm. And I, I would go up to his dressing room every night before the show and say, did you rehearse again today with that? With that guy with the donkeys and everything, and <laughs> he was saying it was all the time, all the time rehearsing this show. So he knew, and Luba wasn't a pro; she didn't know whether it was any good or not. Some of the you know, always ask the dancers that get the chorus; they know when it's going to be a hit or not, pretty much so. Well, I sh also they say don't listen to them when they laugh. If they laugh at your jokes, forget about it, because uh, the, the chorus. 
you know, the chorus is just nice and they, they want the show to be a hit. So uh, why am I fooling with my hair? Um, so I know I, maybe the producers, Joe Kipnis, I think that was our producer. He owned a restaurant and he was a friend of Buddy. Buddy had some friends that we don't, we don't know exactly what their extracurricular activities were. And I think mm -hmm. Joe kind of one of those, not, not a real, hey, not a decent dem guy, but, but, uh, but they, they did a hell of a good job of promoting this because they had Buddy. They had Buddy and they milked that for all. That's why Buddy came out at the end of my number and I had a ball on, on the Sullivan show. People go, why did he come out? I said, it was his show. And, and oh. I'm, doing, I'm doing a four minute number and the dancers are all over the place. And everybody's on, this, on screen except Buddy. And so we have to bring him out because he's the one that's selling the tickets. Of course, yeah. Oh. So when the closing notice was announced, um, what was that moment like for you? Did you have other prospects already in place? Were you ready to go on? Where were you emotionally at that time? I was shocked because I had never done so that I didn't already know the end where it, when it was going to end. You know, I knew the things that I did in Milwaukee was going to end on June 1st. And da, 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 da. and this was, and I was kind of upset because, listen, I went, you know how much money I was making a week? I think I was making $700 a week. Mm. I mean, that, of course, in 1964, I guess that was okay. Um, but, but yes, uh, we have had, we had to turn down some uh, stock because of that. But, there were summer replacement shows. And I did Herman's Hermit, Herman, 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 Hermits, Herman's Hermits. <laughs> Who was he? He had a variety show. So I was a guest on that. And then I was a guest on somebody else's summer replacement. Then I was a guest on somebody else. You know what I was what I wanted. I wanted television. I wanted to be made up and have beautiful hair and beautiful gowns. Except they didn't put me in a gown until much later. I was always in some swell dress because I was the young girl from the Midwest. When the television work began to happen for you, how did that begin to happen? Did you have a manager, an agent, or was it your own pursuits? How, how did it all happen? My, well, my agents at William Morris also represented Merv Griffin, and uh, they represented, uh, they just pulled in their, their chips. You know, they went to anybody. And they had power, the Morris office had power. And so they sold me, but I, I, I mean, I remember, well, you know who else helped sell me was Carol Burnett. She had seen me do Molly Brown. I took over for um, Tammy uh, in Detroit. I took over for her in, in Denver. And then I took over the company and I was in Detroit at the same time, Carol and company. Was How appropriate in. that you took over in Denver. <laughs> and don't you know that I had been horseback riding that day and all of a sudden I get a call, you know, cell phones, you know. So I got back to the, to the apartment where we were staying and they said, you're on. And I went, ah, 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 I'm on. Fortunately, there was uh, the, the stage manager called the critics, the local critics that said, get over here. We got a new girl. But Carol saw me do it in, um, uh, Detroit, and she was there with her company of boy. It was like Carol and Company. Uh, she had already done Gary Moore, or was about to do the end of Gary Moore. So when they were looking for a replacement on Gary Moore, uh, she put in a good word for me, and and so they called me in, and I I, I didn't have to do. I mean, I just came in and did it. I did two guest shots on that. I of course was not hired to be her replacement because I was a stick. I just stood there and sang like a stick. Dorothy Loudon, I think, was the one that they got on. But then shortly mm -hmm. after that, the show went off the air. But uh, but it, uh, it it was the Morris office. And then Carol also is the reason, one of the reasons why I got on the Jim Neighbors Hour, why I was had that out here, because she, she said to Jim, you know, oh, Karen's going to audition. Yeah, yeah, get her if you can, get her if you can. So, which was very nice of her. I didn't do very well on that show either. Fear, honey. Fear, fear, fear. No confidence, 
no sense of 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 who of of no no depth no nothing. That's why I said I was comatose till I was about forty seven. I just didn't know how to put the voice with the person with the there were there were just too many things going on and I didn't I was not vulnerable enough. So, and uh, what changed? Cabaret. Not the, not the musical, but cabaret. No, I know. And uh, I, I did like the brothers and sisters in the Russian tea room. And out here, I did the back lot. And cabaret was beginning to blossom. It was after Barbara. Barbara Cook had started with Wally. And I was like the third person to appear at the brothers and sisters. Helen Gallagher, I think, was before me. It was Barbara, Helen Gallagher, then me. And then, I don't know. Anyway. And that was really something. I mean, here were people, it was like being in my, like being in the classroom with all my classmates and making them laugh and sing and being silly and stupid. And it was absolute me. And that was wonderful. Again, summer stock, because I didn't have critics to worry about. I could play Annie, get your gun, like me. I could do, My Fair Lady was hard, but that's okay. <laughs> I've done more. Somebody, I forgot who it was, that said that Karen Morrow has done more roles secondhand than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I once listed them, and it this was about 15 years ago or so. I had done 64 different roles. Uh, it, it just, I mean, it, you know, it's just go, well, what if, you, if you're a popular person? Well, the worst was I played Lady Tiang. And for John Kenley with Anne Blythe and, uh, oh God, I forgot who the king was. And King and I, Lady Tiang. And of course you were born to play that role. <laughs> <laughs> well, John Kenley was quite, uh, you know, he, uh, he uh, did some very interesting casting. Let's just put it that way. He was a dream. He was a dream for Ohio. This, he was a wonderfully odd man who had great taste and had great ambition, great love of actors and the theater. And he knew how to bring in the audiences. And so as odd as he was, he had to deal with the founding fathers of Ohio, conservative, conservative, conservative. And this man was anything but conservative. He was really odd. They had flaming red hair. And, and uh, uh, but he kept that, that, those theaters alive and brought people there. And uh, so everybody wanted to go there. Everybody wanted to go there. And it was fun. Oh my God. It was just great fun to do all that. So I did that for many, 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 many years. And again, doing stuff I had never, I mean, Lady Tiang, come on. But I learned, I learned from all these guys and the, the directors, we had to learn from one another. Uh, the directors uh, only had six days to put it together. Poor Jack Jones. We did um, Oklahoma at Starlight in Kansas City. And that seats about eight, 9,000 people outdoors. Oh, wow. Well, of course, we all learned our parts. I was uh, Carousel. Carousel, who was I? Uh, in, not Carousel, Oklahoma. I was Edo. Edo in. No. Is that Edo? I get that. Yes. Bridge and, and Meg Brocky. I get all that confused. And he didn't know that he had to memorize everything before. He came in first day of rehearsal, didn't know one line. He said, yeah, where's the music? We, whoa, 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 what? So we all, he just didn't know. No one told him. His manager didn't tell him. His manager didn't know. And so we all worked in, in teams. So I would do two hours with him and then the girl playing uh, Lori would work with him for two hours. Another guy playing Judd would work with him for two hours. And he worked his ass off. Jack was wonderful. Never forgot a line once we got on there. But we used to have fun. You know, it just, there were so many stars that went through that didn't understand what was going on. So, uh, and some that really fell down on the job. I mean, I worked with some people who couldn't, mm -hmm. who couldn't be in front of an audience and who would drink, 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 drink. I remember Frankie Avalon and I were doing uh, anything goes with somebody who's telling me nameless and we'd be on stage and, and whoever was playing, Oh God, 
what's what's the character? Moon, uh, moon, uh, moon was it Moonface? Moon moonface, moon 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 yes. We could hear him retching coming down the steps. Oh my from, God! From his dressing room, and we would go, oh, we would look at each other and stay and go, what are we gonna do? So, I mean, talk about education. Oh my God! Well, you certainly learned that on the road. Well, I if I don't say this, she will kill me. Marianne Lapinto says to say oh. hello to you. She's in the wings watching. No! Yes. Marianne? Oh my God. I think she's been in the opening night of every show that you've ever done. That anybody's ever done. Yes, that's she true. Has been there. She's been the most devoted of anybody, anybody in New York and otherwise. She even came out to St. Louis when, when Leroy, Karen Mason, and I, and Lara Teeter did uh, White Christmas when, when Paul Blake adapted the, the movie to the stage. So we kind of premiered it there and she came out to see all of us because we were, I mean, because Karen and I were like her, you know, her discoveries. I mean, she, mm -hmm. oh, wow. Oh, I'm Marianne. Am so I gonna she's her? watching. Um, you know, I want to, uh, before we run out of time, uh, I want to talk about the association that you've had, speaking of Leroy, uh, with Leroy and Jerry Herman. Uh, oh, yeah. Because the work that the three of you have done together has been just incredible. Well, that was. We we did that for, for quite some time, beautifully, up in the rainbow and stars. I mean, to be up there, literally above the crowd and, and, the, and the stars outside and singing that beautiful music and him playing the piano. And Leroy... Who was never he still is in great voice he was in great voice then and we would do two a night and uh it was re rewarding <laughs> except for the night <laughs> that a, a, an out-of-town tourist group had bought out the room and these people were from either japan or china and you know and i'm singing that will be long as the wonderful place and, wonderful. and i'm seeing all these things and he's doing like casual and the, the audience, because they were so polite and everything, but we we had to stop. We had to go off in the wings and just laugh because it was just falling on these poor people's heads. They didn't know what we were singing about. But Jerry was, when he had a favorite, he had a favorite. And Leroy was his favorite. And I was one of the favorites for a while there. He loved belters. He loved belters with a wide range. Ergo, Edie Gourmet doing his wonderful hit, If He Walked Into My Life. Ergo, after I left uh, the, the show that we toured for 10 years, Debbie Gravett stepped in, who had the same voice, could do the same, you know, did If They Walked Into My Life, she did that. Uh, he, he was just so kind, but, but very real, very, very real. And he would travel with us and we would laugh so hard because people kind of didn't know who he was. You know what I mean? We'd be on the plane, and he'd be he'd be the only one that would be searched at the. Uh, <laughs> and it was Jason. Jason, that's right. That was with Jason Gra. Oh God, and oh help me. And Jason oh. Gra. I mean, first that's another one. You know, uh, just I, I mean the effect, it, it, what a shame that that guy has no talent. And Paige O'Hara, Paige O'Hara, and Don. Pim <clears throat> uh, oh well, Jason. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course, because I'm such a huge fan of his. Oh my God! Well, we become very good friends. He and 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 Glenn and Carol Cook and Tom and Marcia Seligson and her husband and me. I'm always the, the fifth wheel or the seventh wheel or the ninth wheel, depending. And if Dwayne and what's his or his husband come, Dwayne and Frank. Uh, but uh, yeah, Jason makes me laugh all the time. But Jerry, Jerry, uh, and and Michael Kirker from ASCAP, who yes. put this show together. And had us go to all these different places, and he, he he booked just me and Jerry in a couple of places, like like in Washington at the Kennedy Center, and uh, and we would go out on the road and we would do these at, at colleges, major colleges, and then I would do a master class, and so would Jason do a master class, and Don Pippen. Oh, and, God, uh, I love him. Mm -hmm. Oh, please, do you know? I always loved Don, and he was a, kind of a wonderful character, but such a brilliant musician. And he made me sound good when, when I my voice was getting lower. He would lower all the keys in Jerry's show. <laughs> it got to the point where I'd go, light the candle, get <laughs> the rug up, it's today, just so I could get to the high note. 
But uh, I didn't know as much about Don until I read his obituary. And I kicked myself around the house and said, why the hell didn't I know this? To me, Don was Don. He was good. And when we did our, our big showcase, the Jerry Herman showcase at the Hollywood Bowl with all those stars and everything, for 18,000 people, who was conducting the L.A. Philharmonic? Don Pippen, who was standing in the wings ready to go on for her big solo uh, you know, that I don't want to know, me shaking like a leaf. And he looked over to the side and he just smiled and he was ready to he was ready to bring in the orchestra as the, as the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Karen Morrow. And then he looked at me, smiled and brought the orchestra in. And I walked out and I I felt so at home. He just oh. made me feel so good. I just got goosebumps. Oh my God, just got goosebumps. Wow. Well, Karen, I can't believe this hour flew. I can, because I told you I was a talker. I, <laughs> <laughs> I want you to come back once a week. I mean, uh, Shelly Goldstein. I mean, so many people oh, are watching the show. Oh, and Shelly just said, go on for another two and a half hours. But I want to respect your time. I want to respect everyone else's time. I'm going to say my closing remarks. Then I'm going to leave the screen, let you have your closing remarks. And then we're going to uh, end with I Had a Ball. Uh, and uh, I do want to do a shout out, uh, Scott Nevins. I stole this from your YouTube page, so don't hold it against me. I found it this morning and I said, I'm going to use it. So Scott Nevins, thank you for having it out there. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Um, I have been a fan of Karen's for as long as I can remember. I interviewed Karen years ago for my blog, uh, and we were focused only on one show, uh, but today we got a chance to cover so much more. We talked about Hello, Dolly. Do you remember? Oh, now I remember. Because I know, I know I've known you, Richard. And I know all the things that you've done and everything. And I see your face like, oh, there's that face. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then, but I, I have no point. At, 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 so at, at, we, at, we did this interview and very interesting. But now it all makes sense <laughs> because I actually... Uh, that blog, I talked about your doing Dolly, and I called that chapter because I've interviewed all these women who have played Dolly and Leroy Reams, too, who I also saw do Dolly. Sure. But I called your chapter The Reluctant Dolly, and now it makes sense to me. It all makes sense. Everybody go and read the blog, and it'll make sense to you, too. Yeah, uh, but I am such a fan of yours, I always have been. Um, you are the real deal, uh, and I'm sorry that it took you as long to find your confidence as the rest of us already had that confidence in you. So um, as a matter of fact, I want to read you a comment uh, from Larry Olin. I'm going to scroll back here for just a moment. I'm going to pull up his uh, uh, comment here. He says, I've been going to Broadway shows for 61 years. The Sound of Music with Mary Martin in 1960. Because of Karen Morrow, my very favorite show was I Had a Ball. Oh my God. When Karen came out and sang the title song, I shivered. I had a frisson from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. So you've got so many fans. Everybody loves you. Uh, come back to New York and... Do a club, uh, do 54 Below, do the Carlisle, anywhere we want you back here. Can I uh, sit in a chair? Can I sit in a chair? You can sit in a chair. Uh, you can do, uh, I'll come on with you. <laughs> we'll just, I'll ask the questions and you'll just talk. Uh, oh, 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 t t trust me. Trust me. I don't think you want that because I will never leave. Give me oh, a no. spot. I would love it. And if things go according to plan, uh, I am hoping to come to uh, Palm Springs uh, in November with Leroy uh, to, and we want to do an evening with Carol Cook uh, just to get together. Hopefully I'll see you when that happens. Uh, and, uh, but everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, please leave a comment on YouTube, share this with your friends. Uh, so many of my favorite people are here this afternoon. This has been the most delightful Saturday afternoon. I will float on this for a long time. Oh, Richard. I, I, I know it's a cliche, Karen, what? but I had a ball. Uh, 
Now, I always end my shows by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the seventh name that pops up. Reach out with a phone call, not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call, and let that person know what they mean to you. Jim Brochu, change your mind. Come on this show. Oh, please, no. Jim. Oh, my God, yes. I'd love to have you here. You've got some great stories to tell, and I want to share them with as many people as possible. Uh, and uh, But as my dear friend Sean Moniger says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. Uh, so, Karen, I'm going to leave the screen. I'm going to give you the final word. And as soon as you say, I had a ball, we'll play your song. Okay? It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so I get to talk? Oh, dear. I didn't, okay. Uh, thank you. And again, I thank all those people for all these years who have supported, even though I haven't been on Broadway, haven't been on television that much, uh, I am so appreciative of this community. Without this community, I would have nothing. I teach a lot and I teach because I teach what I know and what I've learned. And I've been doing it for 27 years. I've had a workshop and they just keep getting better and better and more interesting and more interesting. And the, the people, the average age of my group now is 74 and they're still going strong. There are people from Broadway. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for, for paying attention. Thank you for tuning in today. And thank you for seeing me in my kitchen, my yellow and red kitchen. Richard, you are wonderful. I'm honored that you asked me to do this. So bye. in the world. Do you see that plot up there with a the number nine? It's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Love was hiding around the corner this long